We're going to cover a lot of the path things, but if you go back to the Vespard's notes as well as Tushar's notes, um, then it will be, there'll be far more details there if you're anything like me. <clears throat> as long as your matrix hasn't changed, um, these are pretty much the things that you should know, um, at least for your actual content exam versus the, the um, pathology exam. I'll go through all of these and at the bottom I've got five key points on pretty much every uh, heme condition you need to know which will come up in PATH so you'll get that in the post um, lecture slides. Heme is a fair number of questions so six is quite a few. Most people do reasonably well on them so five out of six which is quite good and we had a whole station for it. I had a look at your OSCE sheet of what you can get um, so anemia would be relatively likely, and they also had DVT, PE, which I'll talk about, but they'll also go through in RESP um, tomorrow as well. So this is just all of the heme conditions that you need to know, and then the uh, ratings for all of them. Not a lot of these things will come up. Anemia, you do need to know relatively back to front with an emphasis on your IgA and megaloblastic. And then I would probably say your leukemia would come up, but obviously that won't be one of your OSCEs. I'll go through these things. So it's all the matrix stuff, um, but there's some buzzwords and five key points at the end. So all of the red things are things to know if you're gonna learn like a few key things about that condition. Um, and the purple are buzzwords associated with the condition. If this is the only time I get to talk to you about OSCEs, remembering that everything that they'll put in the STEM is there for a reason. So the age and the sex will usually be like that smack bang typical patient. And after COVID, when you're thinking about OSCEs, think about the presenting complaints based on different ages. So if you have someone who's presenting with fatigue as a child versus an adolescent or different age groups, there'll be different differentials you're thinking about. Same goes for chest pain, shortness of breath, everything. Um, and that'll be important next year in, um, say, GP and PEDS. The way, obviously, you guys have the blueprint, anemia will be a big one. Um, in your questions, it might come up about like a lump and working out different things about a lump, which I'll go through. And people in real life will present with tiredness, lymphadenopathy, so just noticing lumps um, and also bruising or bleeding. The main takeaway for heme is that if you find any symptoms of a low blood group, so low red blood cells being anemia, you have to ask about the other two. Because if you think it's just an iron deficiency anemia and you've missed the fact that actually it's a pancytopenia, so you also have low platelets and white cells and you're missing leukemia, something bad. Approach to a lump, so this can be applied to anything, so breast lumps, um, lymph nodes, anything. Um, working out where it is, the size and shape, so if something is well circumscribed, it's nice and smooth, then you're thinking it's more benign. Whereas if it's speculated and nasty feeling, then maybe it's gonna be more nasty. In terms of heme for your lymph nodes, if you feel a rubbery lump, that's sort of buzzwordy for lymphoma, whereas rock hard is metastatic carcinoma. If you have a skin cancer on your arm, it would drain to your elbow and your um, armpit. So just remembering a little bit of your drainage. So like cervical lymphadenopathy being the throat. Slip signs associated with a um, lipoma, a sort of a buzzword for that. And how tender it is. So if something, if a lymph node is tender, it's usually reactive. So associated with an infection. And if it's not, it's probably cancer related. Localized lymphadenopathy. So when it's just in a discrete area is usually an infection. So they can happen if you've got a cellulitis on your lower leg, then it might be at the groin, but they'll be reactive. So tender um, and they all be softish. Um, solid tumor metastases and lymphoma, they'll differ based on consistency. Generalized things are gonna be infections or conditions that affect all of your body. Um, and lymphoma can present early in just one section and can spread to other lymph nodes as well. Um, HIV and TB are good ones to think of if someone presents with lymphadenopathy and it's widespread. Other differentials, lipoma with your slip sign. And there's one question that comes back and haunts people being about safinovarix, which is your varicose veins. And it usually happens in the femoral vein or a pseudoaneurysm after say a cath lab visit. Um, and that should be pulsatile and also in the femoral region. Hernia is usually femoral as well. And ganglion cysts come up in uh, GP, but they happen in the wrist usually.
your written exams, how I would go about this is looking at all the details. Again, everything's in there for a reason. If they're telling you lots of cardiac things and you're looking for a cardiac cause, um, looking at what the actual question is asking for. And the main one that trips people up is your diagnostic versus next investigation. And so buckling down a little bit on investigations, less so on management for third year. I also look at all the options, write down what you know about everything. So a few things, and then that can help you pull out the pertinent details and try and look for certain things in the question, um, rather than trying to fit the question to the options. If in doubt, pick C. I've written your cluster questions here. They're a little bit difficult. And I think ultimately, if you got an anemia station, it would be iron deficiency anemia or your macrocytic, primarily um, B12 and folate. But otherwise, there's other things here that you should ask as well. All right, this picture, I think, is a really good summary of what um, hematology is all about. It has, it shows you the hematopoietic stem cell system, but also has obviously the conditions on top of it. So what you can already tell is that your acute leukemias have a blastic blast cell appearance. Your more chronic conditions where they're further down in development of the uh, whatever blood cell we're talking about, go, are they going to look more like the normal cell, but there's just more of them. Myeloproliferative disorders is essentially chronic myeloid conditions. So CML fits into here. And this is from the PATH lecture, which I quite liked because it explains why your CML sits with your myeloproliferative. So you essentially get lots of these, whereas some of the other myeloproliferative disorders, you just get more of one of them. Plasma cells are memory B cells. Um, so that creates multiple myeloma. And then remembering that you can have low levels of any of these as well. So I like this picture and I don't think it comes up very much. Knowing a little bit about your lymph nodes and spleen, technically there's like rumor that comes out every year that there's an there's a OSCE about a splenectomy counseling, which sounds horrific, but knowing a little bit about the lymph nodes and the spleen, which are essentially um, the intersection between certain fluids and the immune system. So for the spleen, it's blood in the immune system, lymph nodes, it's sort of tissues, um, fluid. Um, and this is where they can survey fluid and they can start an immune response if they need to. There's a five key point slide at the end of the post slides that goes through everything you'd need to talk about in a splenectomy, which is essentially vaccinations. Um, oh, am I going to remember now? You need to go on a spleen registry and you need to wear a medical alert plus antibiotics. And they're the main things. All right, so getting into our anemia a little bit more, the key symptoms that you're going to ask about essentially your cluster questions or things you're looking for on exam are fatigue. And so this can present with excess sleeping, poor concentration, that sort of thing, shortness of breath, palpitations, um, plus or minus chest pain. So this can be a, uh, an exacerbation of angina in like a real life, not in your OSCEs, that would be mean. Dizziness as well when they, when they sit and then stand up too quickly and you're looking for any pallor, paleness of the whites of their eyes, and as well as tachycardia. Again, if you find an anemia, you need to ask about the other blood groups. Have they had any bleeding from the gums? If they get an injury, do they bleed for a long time? And have they had any recurrent infections? So throat or chest infections usually. Then we're gonna ask about risk factors for microcytic anemia, macrocytic and normocytic, and we'll go through what those are, but the main ones for microcytic being what's your diet like? Do you menstruate a lot or do you have a family history? And macrocytic being the other R1 would be about their diet and any drugs or absorption issues. So we will go through all of this. You're going to mirror that in your FBE. So if you do an FBE and you find low hemoglobin, you have to look if they've got low platelets and low white, blood, white cells as well. And then also considering the MCV and the MCH, so you can tell if it's micro, normal, or macrocytic. These are the buzzwords or the mnemonics associated with the different types. And I put in red the big ones to know. Obviously, your microcytic and macrocytic are the R1s. So knowing megaloblastic, your iron deficiency, plus thalassemia being the main differential in a microcytic anemia. 
um, and hemolysis comes up, but it's not particularly important, but remembering that cancer can cause a normocytic anemia plus a pancytopenia. The main, I suppose having a nice structure for what you can ask and how you ask this in an OSCE is really important. So think about poor production. So even though you've got everything that you need, your bone marrow is just not having a bar of it. So this would be that um, you've got bone marrow failure because of aplastic anemia, infiltration from cancer, those sorts of things. Um, you're not making it actually very well or poor resources. So this is going to be a big one. So you've got a bad diet, or even though you're taking it in, you can't absorb it. So all of your gastrointestinal things that I think you guys have already been through today. Excess loss or breakdown, so colorectal cancer being your big thing that you really don't want to miss as well, um, can present with an iron deficiency anemia from chronic blood loss. Menstruation, young females, um, and there are some other things that are less important. Increased requirements comes up in women's and PEDS next year. Um, so not this year. In terms of the important bloods, FBE, so you need to be able to recognize an anemia and work out what type of anemia it is, but also checking that it's not a pancytopenia. You're also going to order tests that investigate the cause. So anemia is a symptom. Anemia is never the bottom line. You need to work out why they have this anemia. And so your iron studies will be a big one, B12 and folate being your two big R1s. Uh, but you might also, you'll order a blood film as well, especially if it's normocytic, because we're worried about a hemolytic picture. Um, and they're your two big main presentations or features of your blood film. So iron deficiency anemia, you can see that there's a massive white section in the middle because they're really pale. Um, and you've got some funky looking cells like your pencil cells and a bit of a target cell there. In terms of your macrocytic, your megaloblastic, you've got this multi-lobed neutrophil. So if you see that, or if you see a blood film, look to the neutrophil. Um, and you can also see that these are big, fat, juicy red blood cells. So very macrocytic. Hemolysis screen, I've put this here, but we'll go through it again in a little bit. The other thing, especially if you have found a pancytopenia, you are going to order a blood, a bone marrow, not a blood film, but also a blood film. You don't really need to know this. I put it in here for completion's sake. You um, probably don't, probably really don't need to know this. That's what a normal one looks like. It can become hypocellular or hypercellular. The classic hypercellular would be a CML where it's packed with cells of all different um, stages of the, of the progression. Um, myelofibrosis is associated with the buzzword of a dry tap. Fibro fibrosis being scarring, so there's no nice blood in there. It's all nasty. And hypocellular, the classic one being aplastic anemia. I put a summary of the blood cells or the blood film findings in here, um, but I've got pictures as we go, so that's just for you guys. All right, a question to start us off. You've got a blood film in a 24 year old female. She's tired and it's microcytic hypochromic. So you can send them to me individually, please. I'm gonna go so red by the end of this, but anyway. Perfect, you guys have done very well, Jay. So the most likely cause in this, in a young female and most likely cause of anemia overall is an iron deficiency anemia. So this is microcytic and it's because of low cellular iron. We know this, it's common. This is the most common anemia, most common microcytic anemia as well. The main risk factors to ask would be, or you, you will know if they're female, what their periods are like. So if it's really heavy and that's where they're losing blood, if they're pregnant, um, which you guys probably won't get in your station, what their diet is like, um, and then other gastro things. So if that's where the loss is, or if that's where their poor uptake is. And this will play into your management. So when you're doing an OSCE, you need to find out what's the diagnosis, why do they have it, and what can I change to help them? So asking about SNAPW will be important in some cases as well. Um, SNAPW being smoking, nutrition, alcohol, um, physical exercise and weight loss for anyone who doesn't know that. Features, 
classic anemia signs. So you know that they've got red, low red blood cells from fatigue, shortness of breath, palpitations. They look pale and they can have a high heart rate because they've got essentially lower oxygen or they've got to work harder for it. Key findings to iron deficiency anemia, angular stomatitis, and it's usually bilateral. So unilateral would indicate like an infection, endogenous causes will be bilateral. Quilinichia, so spooning of their nails. Um, pica, which is when they want to eat things that aren't food. There's a syndrome that has dysph dysphagia because of esophageal webs. I do not think that would come up, but if it does, just being able to recognize it. Restless leg syndrome as well. How are we going to investigate these? On our FBE, they've got low hemoglobin, low MCV, low MCH, a microcytic anemia. Iron studies, essentially, it's all mumbo jumbo except for your ferritin. And if you have a low ferritin, it's iron deficiency. And then if they have a low hemoglobin, it's iron deficiency anemia. Um, our blood film, we went through a pencil cell, lots of central pallor, um, and that's pretty much it. And you're also going to investigate the cause. So a fecal occult blood test will look for your colorectal cancer, um, plus or minus colonoscopy. And if they've got celiac disease, celiac serology, serology endoscopy, um, and we've already done their iron levels. The way you manage this is essentially just giving them the iron back. So we try and do it dietary because it's quite good and you can tell them to drink orange juice as well. Otherwise you put them on oral replacement and that's usually for six months, so quite a while. And you give it with vitamin C as well to help with uptake. What you should tell them about is constipation and also black stool. So in someone who you think might have a colorectal cancer, you need to investigate this first. Um, and even if they've got peptic ulcer disease and we're causing black stools, but their peptic ulcer disease is causing black stools, we might not find that melina as early. If they have absorption issues, they're not getting it from their diet. If we put them on oral supplements, it's not going to work. So we need to give it in an IV. And if it's really bad or they're going to have surgery or something where they need red blood cells now, we'll give a transfusion. Most likely cause of anemia and most likely cause of microcytic anemia. These are the uh, iron studies, not particularly important to go through, but just knowing low ferret serum ferritin is IgA. Um, and there's some other comparison tables that are quite good, but I don't think it's particularly important to harp on about this. Um, I suppose our OSCE was a B12 and they had normal iron studies. Um, it was microcytic as well, but Knowing a little bit about how to interpret these will serve you well. All right, next question. You've got a seven month old baby, hypochromic microcytic anemia, target cells, nucleated blood cells, and high HBF. Good. I had like scheduled like a minute for all of these questions. You guys are just doing good. I don't want to see any question marks. If you guys are in your OSCEs as well, go just be confident. I mean, you're allowed question marks, but yes. <laughs> good. I got an exclamation point. Excellent. So this is most likely B. Um, it is a particularly bad thalassemia because it's happening early. We'll go through what happens when you change your hemoglobin, but essentially it's around the time when this patient is going to change from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin and clearly something's gone wrong. Oh, another question. 17-year-old tourist from the West Indies presents with pain in his abdomen and hands and pyrexial and anemic, so pyrexial being febrile. So this one is a little bit weird and doesn't give you much information, but this one is a sickle cell disease. So the background being typical and pain in the abdomen and in your small vessels of your hands um, in the setting of a fever is typical of a sickle cell crisis. But we will go through both of these. So these are both types of hemoglobinopathies which is essentially when you've inherited something that mucks up with your hemoglobin. The two to know are thalassemia and sickle cell disease. 
Um, because you've got that mutation, you don't make your hemoglobin as well. They can um, polymerize in chains rather than in their nice uh, tetramer, so four. Um, and that means that your red blood cell doesn't work and gets taken out of the system, so you have an anemia. It technically can be anormocytic as well because they get lies, um, but knowing it as part of a microcytic. But there should be characteristic features that will tell you even if it's anormocytic. The two main ways we will diagnose this are with a HB gel electrophoresis. So essentially it just runs them along and they're different weights so you can separate them out. DNA analysis is usually for alpha. So a little bit about our normal hemoglobin because I think it tells you a lot about what's going on in these conditions. You normally have four globins and four iron, which we know. Alpha hemoglobin has four alleles, beta globin has two alleles and that plays into the different presentations we can have. The, the key thing to know is that alpha is usually more severe because you need it from day, well, you need it from week six and you need it for the rest of your life. Beta hemoglobin or beta thalassemia will show up later because you swap to using it after birth. So you might not find anything until they have, they're meant to swap at six months and it doesn't happen because they've got defect, defects in their beta globin. Um, so it's relatively common in Australia, so 5%, and it's because we have a lot of people from overseas. Um, and if they have really severe disease, they need a lot of transfusion, so they can die earlier. Our beta thalassemia, which we said was two alleles, can have three main phenotypes, and that's because you get a point mutation, um, and that can happen in lots of different places. So a lot of it will contribute to your beta thalassemia intermedia, because there are different spectrums of function. So you either have, you're pretty okay, or you're pretty bad, and there's a massive range in the middle because there are lots of different changes that can happen. If you have beta thalassemia minor, it's pretty much asymptomatic, except you'll have findings on your FBE, and you'll have a normal iron study. So you might not even know about it. And that's your biggest differential for a relatively asymptomatic iron deficiency anemia. Intermedia, you might need transfusions when your body's under a lot of stress. Um, and thalassemia major is when you need those transfusions a lot. And it happens really early when you change away from your fetal hemoglobin. So that would be the classic um, presentation for a beta thal. Alpha, you have four phenotypes because we have four alleles. And in that case of alpha, they completely delete. So it's, pretty, it's easier to work out what's happening. A silent carrier, you've still got three normal alpha. Alpha trait, similar to beta minor, you pretty much don't know about it. Intermedia, also called HBH disease, is when you get this chronic microcytic anemia. You can be symptomatic, but you're usually fine until you have physiological stress, so an infection, surgery, whatever. And in this one, you have two normal, two uh, absent. And your alpha major, which is HB Bart, you have nothing. And this will present uh, intrauterine because we know that at six weeks, you start using your alpha globin. Um, and these babies will need transfusions to give them the alpha globin so that they can survive. We're going to investigate these people. So they'll have varying ranges of anemia, but it will generally be microcytic. Iron studies will be normal, and that will be the key in telling you it's this versus iron deficiency. The film, we're seeing um, there's lots of central pallor. Key in these ones are target cells. So you see that less in other conditions. Um, teardrop cells like here. And you can see sickle cells in this because your dodgy hemoglobin can still form those chains. So like this one up the top here. But the history will be different for this compared to a sickle cell disease. Your HB electrophoresis tests your beta globin and can tell you a little bit about both of these, but in your severe alpha or in your um, minor alphas, you need to look at DNA. That's wrong, sorry. Your major ones you'll be able to find. Microsic anemia, normal iron. Sickle cell anemia is a similar concept. So you've got one single mutation and it's making HBS. You can be heterozygote, which is um, thought to be protective in areas with malaria, or homozygote, where you have sickle cell disease. The main risk factors are Mediterranean African background, 
Um, but as we saw in that um, story, there can be Indian heritage as well um, and areas of malaria for that heterozygote protection. Pathogenic, uh, pathogenesis, pretty much what we said. What's new in this one is that because they're deformed, they don't go through capillaries as well. And so they form clots at the bases of the capillaries. And so you'll get um, symptoms in your hands, tummy, places where there's small vessels. So that is our sickle cell crisis when you have an acute trigger and then they have acute pain and hemolysis. So abdominal pain classically um, or ongoing erections. Your chronic effects are these clots. And so they can happen in lots of different places um, and your brain causing strokes is a big one. Investigating it, again, a microcytic anemia, the sickle cells will be classic and you'll probably have this, um, they'll probably give you an acute um, crisis and that will be the main uh, presentation along with this film. Um, and you can look at beta uh, globin on your HB electrophoresis, which will tell you. So this one is anemia plus pain. All right, another question. I can't see because I've got things all over my screen. 40 year old woman, she's tired, pale, tachycardic, hypopigmented. Um, she has a history of thyroid problems in her mother and tummy troubles. She has anemia and an MCV that's high. What has caused this? Less options this time, which is good. Yes, you guys have all worked things out pretty well. There are only a couple of causes here of macrocytic anemia being folate or vitamin B12. It's pretty hard to work out which one is which, but the story does give us a bit of an idea. So what this is telling you, hypopigmented areas, vitiligo, thyroid problems, we're thinking graves, tummy troubles, maybe an inflammatory thing as well. So all of those things are telling us about something immune. So this could either be a Crohn's disease impairing uptake at your terminal ileum, or it could be a pernicious anemia. Oh, and I've got another one. 23 year old woman on trimethoprim for a current urinary tract infections, and she's got a macrocytic anemia. Good. Excellent. So folate deficiency. So this is knowing a little bit about trimethoprim because it impairs folate um, uptake for the bacteria. Who knows? It's too hard to remember, but it interferes with folate. So she's now got an anemia because of that. So these, those two, folate and B12, make our megaloblastic anemia, which is a type of macrocytic anemia. And they're quite closely linked because they impair... Um, DNA synthesis when they're deficient together because they're coenzymes. And the key thing to remember is that we want to supplement them both together because even though you've found that one is low, if the other one's low as well, then it's like they're both low, if that makes sense. So you need them both to be high to have optimal DNA synthesis. Risk factors, pernicious anemia. So that really inflammatory picture, autoimmune picture that we were being painted would play into a pernicious anemia, or if you've got no parietal cells. So pernicious anemia is autoantibodies against either parietal cells in the stomach or intrinsic factor itself. Both of those things help bind B12 in the stomach. They travel down to the terminal ileum together and get absorbed. So if you have issues at the terminal ileum or with your intrinsic factor or with your parietal cells, then you're not going to absorb B12 effectively. Folate, pregnancy. So if they haven't got any supplements, um, then you need a lot of folate for the neural tube formation. Methotrexate is a really big one. And so you need to, if you're going to mention methotrexate, always add folate supplementation and same with trimethoprim. And again, um, absorption issues. The main features, so they both will cause anemia. We know that. B12 has a little extra on the side where it will produce neurological symptoms. The main one to mention is, have you had any um, changes in sensation to your hands or feet? Um, and if they've got pernicious anemia, it's associated with some autoimmune things, hyperpigmentation, 
which is weird because vitiligo gives you hypopigmentation, but remembering any skin changes I think would be pretty easy. Your investigations. So now we're at a macrocytic anemia. We can look at our film and it looks nice and juicy and our neutrophil has lots of lobes. So it should usually have about three. So this is a more normal looking one, um, but there's quite a few here, which means that it's hyper segmented and that's classic for the megaloblastic and that's diagnostic of a megaloblastic anemia. Um, you can do a bone marrow biopsy. It doesn't tell you much that the film didn't tell you. Schilling's test is um, it's where you've got radio uh, labeled B12 and you are making them drink it and you see how much is absorbed and it's a little bit complex, but essentially it tells you if they have pernicious anemia or an absorption issue um, or if they're normal. And you can also look for the antibodies themselves for pernicious anemia. The way we manage it is treating the cause. So if it's methotrexate and trimethoprim, then if they can stop it, then stop that. B12 supplementation, we really want to give that because the neurological symptoms can be permanent um, and folate at the same time, regardless of the cause. What you do need to consider in all of these instances is if, if they have issues with absorption, you need to give it um, parenterally. So usually IV, or I think one of these is an IM injection. So this one is anemia, neurological symptoms, lobed neutrophils. All right, another question. All right, read it. 24-year-old female, anemia, splenomegaly. She has a negative direct Coombs. She has reticulocytes and spherocytes. While you guys are thinking about this, even though they're moving away from buzzwords, sometimes there are only so many ways they can say something. Because Medicine is named after silly things. This one is a hereditary spherocytosis. So the fact that there are spherocytes on blood film pretty much tells you that this is what it is. So hereditary spherocytosis is an example of a hemolytic anemia, which is essentially when you just have excess breakdown there are lots of different causes. So intrinsic have an earlier onset. So usually children um, with a family history. Extrinsic is later on and it's usually acquired things. Um, your, the main ones to remember would be a G6PD, which is about metabolism. And your hereditary spherocytosis is because you've got an impermeable mem membrane or a um, stiff membrane. Extrinsic would be your autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which the um, question told you she had a normal Coombs test, so isn't that. Hypersplenism, so things that cause that, um, the main one to remember is portal hypertension and mechanical destruction. So this is where PATH comes into it, remembering the differences between all of these conditions. Essentially what links them together is that you've got endothelial damage, you form your fibrin mesh, where all of your platelets are getting stuck and your coagulation factors are uh, all activating. And when you form the lattice, your red blood cells can't get through and they get all cut up and your platelets get cut up as well. So that's what causes the anemia. Mechanical valves, instead of your red blood cells bouncing off a nice tissue, they get sheared by the metal. Features is a little bit hard. They'll have anemia. You'll probably go straight to investigations, but intrinsic causes, they might have a fava bean triggering a bout of jaundice and they're also anemic. Um, liver failure, I think, being a main one and then anything indicating like a chronic myeloid leukemia. Investigations, we have normal, like a normocytic anemia and they'll have high reticulocytes. So your bone marrow is trying to say, I don't have enough here. Let's push out these little babies that we have and try and fill our blood. Um, in a very acute bleed, you won't have high reticulocytes, but if it's a bleed that happened a little while ago, then you will. Um, you'll see that on your blood film. You've also got your schistocytes and little fragments um, around the place, and you will have low thrombocytes as well if it's one of your um, fibrin mesh cause conditions. You can do your Coombs test, and the direct gives you the answer about hemolytic anemia. Um, so you're looking specifically for antibodies 
and what's happening to the cells in that patient. And your hemolysis screen will show characteristic changes of hemolysis, which we'll go through in just a second. Um, treat the cause, treat the symptoms. So you're going to give them their red blood cells back um, and in DIC, give them fresh frozen plasma because they've used up all of their coagulation factors and platelets. Normocytic anemia, positive Coombs test is the most likely way that they will present this to you guys. And it's probably the worst part of him, I think. So this is your hemolysis screen. Um, I remember it as Cherbal. So your Coombs test, haptoglobin, unconjugated bilirubin, um, reticulocytes, blood film, lactate dehydrogenase. So we've been through the blood film. Our reticulocytes we know about. Coombs test, it goes through here. It's not particularly important to know how it happens, but just knowing that that's your hemolytic anemia for your direct Coombs test. Haptoglobin binds hemoglobin. So if you've got your red blood cells and it's lysed, you've got more hemoglobin, so your haptoglobin goes down because it's really busy. Unconjugated bilirubin, you break open your hemoglobin and all of that bilirubin has to go somewhere, so it's in the blood before it gets to the liver. And lactate dehydrogenase is just part of your enzymes inside your red blood cells and now you're measuring it outside. These are some summaries for the other random conditions. I've also put five key points at the bottom. Um, Maha we talked about, it's anything that causes any widespread illness and it causes a fibrin mesh that shears your cells. DIC is pretty similar, but also you're using all of your coagulation factors in one area and bleeding somewhere else. And this will be a really sick patient in ICU. Hemolytic uremic syndrome is rare. Happens in kids after they have a bout of gastro. Um, their anemia and thrombocytopenia are because of the Maha fibrin mesh, and it also affects their kidneys. TTP is all of those features of HUS, but you're also adding purpura and CNS symptoms, so tonic-clonic seizures. And these two are examples of hemolysis. And I put the blood films here if they ever show you them. All right, a question. 23 year old man, he's got nosebleeds and infections and he just had some chemotherapy. What do you think he has? Good, pretty much all the right answers, which is good. So what this one is telling you is that they have low platelets and low white cells. What the chemotherapy is getting you to think about is they've probably gotten rid of all of their highly proliferative cells. And one of the main places that you, if the main place that chemotherapy will affect to cause those symptoms will be an aplastic anemia. So your bone marrow has been knocked out. Um, and this is a reason why patients will get a um, febrile neutropenia, so they get fevers because of their low neutrophil count after chemotherapy, because we've killed them all. Um, so it's a pancytopenia, but it's because the bone marrow isn't working just because, rather than a leukemia, which is pancytopenia because it's making something else. So the main causes or the risk factors associated with this can be nothing. So it's usually idiopathic. Something to remember is parvovirus B19 causes aplastic anemia in children, which we'll learn about next year, and chemotherapy. So anything that kills highly proliferative cells will also affect your bone marrow, along with ionizing radiation, which might be iatrogenic if we're about to give them a stem cell transplant. Features, so they'll have pancytopenia. They'll have features of low red blood cells being anemia low platelets, which is essentially all sorts of bleeding, um, and then low white cells, so infections. And they're the main questions that you should ask in any station that sounds like heme or any even screening if something weird is going on and you're not sure what's up. Investigations, we've got normocytic anemia, low platelets and low white cells, so a pancytopenia. Um, the film will show not many cells because the bone marrow isn't producing many cells. And any pancytopenia, we're doing a bone marrow biopsy. So we're going to see that there's not much happening in there. Lots of fat and little clusters of cells, but not enough to sustain your blood counts. Um, 
I just remembered in if you're in an OSCE and you do see low hemoglobin, low platelets, low white cells, wrap that up in a bow and say this patient has pancytopenia. That would be Schoff's kiss. Differential, which we talked about, is if you've got a bone marrow infiltration because of something else, so leukemia being blast cells, and that's your main scary differential for this. Treatment, so if they're on chemotherapy and you can stop it, try to, otherwise supportive. So we're going to address the red blood cells, address the platelets, address the white cells um, with antibiotics, a blood transfusion and a plat platelet transfusion. And then your bone marrow stimulants. So um, GCSF, which is your, I don't know what the G is, but co colony stimulating something. That was bad, but it, it makes your bone marrow produce more of everything. And that's commonly given with chemo. Looks like leukemia, but it's not. All right, so we're on to coagulation. I think we're making good time. I think um, knowing this will give you a good idea of what um, is going wrong. So initially when you have endothelial damage, you get platelets, von Willebrand's factor, and then you have to reinforce your platelet plug with your coagulation cascade. Those two halves of the one process will present differently. Um, the other thing to consider is your inhibitors. So if you have a failure of your inhibitors, you will get more clotting and that sort of contributes to your inherited causes of um, hypercoagulability in your Verkau's triad. What a mouthful. All right, so let's start. A 45 year old man, X-linked disorder of coagulation. He's had multiple episodes of bleeding. He's bled into his joint. He gets regular transfusions of some drug to help him with the bleeding. What have they been giving him? Good. You guys are more clever than I am. I got this wrong when I first did it. Good. So this one is D. The main one that you, you would be tossing up between would be D and E. The reason that it's D being factor eight, so your haemophilia A, is that it's more common than, than haemophilia B, which is your factor nine, which is option E. Um, the rest of them are associated with, well, they're not gonna be particularly helpful and usually gonna make him bleed more. Um, all right, so this is a deficiency usually inherited and it's of your coagulation factors. Haemophilia A is factor eight. They sort of sound the same and that's the more common one. Haemophilia B is factor nine and that is your Christmas disease. Um, your risk factors predominantly happens in males because it's an X-linked recessive condition, although haemophilia B can happen in anyone and usually they'll have a family history. Your main features of a coagulation related bleed are big, I think of big things. Hemarthrosis, you're bleeding into your big joints. You'll have big muscles in your, big bruises in your muscles um, and really big bruises. Um, I don't know why it's called Christmas disease, it just is. Um, and a rule of thumb for most things is that if it presents earlier, it's usually worse. Um, and that means you have more of a deficiency. So you don't actually have to have, you don't have zero. There's a spectrum of disease where sometimes you have a little bit less or absolutely, almost none. We're going to test their FBE and they've got normal platelets, which is what we expect because this isn't a platelet picture. Coagulation, they'll have a long APTT because both of these are part of your intrinsic pathway. Table tennis with the TT, you play indoors um, and PT tennis, you play outdoors extrinsic. You can test the actual levels and you'll see that they're both low. Oh, apparently it was named after the child who had it, who was called Christmas, presumably the last name, I guess. Um, in most cases, you will just, um, you'll just support them. So if they don't, you know, run into a wall every day or they don't play contact sports, they should be fine. If they do bleed, you're just going to treat them a bit more, um, proactively and so you're going to apply a lot of pressure keep an eye on it um, that sort of stuff and just tell them to be careful if they do bleed they might get a coagulation factor infusion then if they've got really severe spontaneous bleeds we're going to be a bit pro more proactive and regularly replace their coagulation factors 
boy bleeding big bruises. Von Willebrand's disease. So this one is related to our platelet plug rather than our coagulation aspect. Um, and this means that you can't form that first step. Main risk factors is actually not um, any gender or sex related um, risk factors and there's pretty much nothing else. You can, um, again, a spectrum of disease, they can be asymptomatic and this might be incidentally picked up in someone that has heavy menstrual bleeding or the first time they had the, um, any dental procedures, so usually wisdom teeth removal, they might have bled a lot. And so that's a good question to ask about and that is asked in hospitals a lot. It can present as platelet picture and also coagulation picture. And I realize I haven't gone through what your platelet symptoms are, but it's your petechiae, um, bleeding from gums a little bit, that sort of thing. Coagulation symptoms is because your von Willebrand's interacts with factor eight and prolongs its life in the blood. In the rare type, you can have severe and spontaneous bleeding, which is called type three, type one being the least bad, type two is your medium. Investigations, your FBA will be normal. Coagulation is largely normal as well, except for something called a bleeding time, which used to be essentially you nick the patient and you count how long they bleed for. Um, and that can be a little bit long because it's that first step. Um, when you measure your von Willebrand's factor, it's low. And again, factor eight can be low as well because they work together. Interesting, the management for this is a drug called desinpressin, which is related to your ADH pathway. This works in your mild type, which is where you've got less because it makes your endothelium make more von Willebrand's factor, which is very cool. But in your type three, when you have absolutely no von Willebrand's, uh, it doesn't work. But, and in that case, I don't know what you do and you don't need to know either. So this is the most common cause of prolonged bleeding in most people, in everyone. These are some other causes of bleeding. You guys can go through this. Your thrombocytopenia related to all of your um, fibrin mesh thingies. Um, and essentially you just watch and wait and you can give corticosteroids for immune causes. Um, TMA is similar to your like Mahas and stuff like that. Um, and it includes your Hus and TTP. Two important ones I think to know would be your liver disease. So even though you lose a lot of clotting factors, you can both bleed and clot and it's a bit odd, but just remembering that that can be a cause and your vitamin K deficiency. So in someone with cystic fibrosis that can't absorb their fat soluble vitamins being A, D, E and K, you're worried about prolonged bleeding in those patients. Um, if you have any questions about these, absolutely let me know um, and we can go through them. Right, you guys can send me a message. All right, a question. 46 year old non-smoker presents to emergency with acute pleuritic chest pain, shortness of breath, inability to go for a walk, they're hypoxic, they're afebrile, they've got a high respiratory rate, their heart rate is up there as well. When you listen to their chest, there's nothing there, but they do have a sore calf. Their FBE is normal, what do they have? Excellent, nothing gets past the A team three Bs. Yes, I, I actually added an extra buzzword to this because I was like, mm, I don't know. Perfect. This is a PE. Um, so everything tells us that they've got something going on. Hypoxia plus a high rest rate in the tachycardia plus the calf pain. My gosh. So I'll sort of whiz through this and this is your like really crude summary because um, I'll go through it again, but know this back to front. DVT, you've got a clot in your deep venous system, usually in your legs. Risk factors being your Verkau's triad, and these are some easy ones to ask. Features, you have a unilateral swan, one side, a red hot swollen calf. Your main differential for this would be a cellulitis. Um, and that's a good one to keep in mind. Human sign and Pratt sign are technically um, uh, some things to remember, but I don't think they ever really come up. Um, and essentially it's just, they're sore. Something to remember is that if you measure them, they'll be, it'll be bigger on one side. Investigation, so a well score, which I'll do, I'll talk through in pulmonary embolus. Um, and 
that will guide whether or not you're going to do a D-dimer or go straight to investigations, partly for DBT, but definitely for PE. They'll have a normal white cell count um, because it's not an infection, but there is inflammation. And so that's why it's hot. Um, and you've got lots of signs of inflammation. So there are five cardinal signs of inflammation that you guys should know, red, hot, sore, edematous, and loss of function. Um, and, but you won't have any infectious signs. Um, LFTs, if that's the cause, D-dimer will give you a good indication and that will be um, high. And if you do an ultrasound, you were looking, you're looking for your big vein and also your artery. And when you apply pressure from the top with the, the probe, normally your vein will compress and your artery won't because it's nice and elastic. If there's something in here, it won't compress. And so that's how you know that there's a clot or there's something happening. Essentially, you're going to give them immediate blood thinning medication and long-term blood thinning medication. You can put a little filter in their, in their inferior vena cava to stop things from coming up and going to their lungs. That's what it looks like, a little bit inconspicuous, um, but if you measured them, you can sort of tell that they would be quite different. PE is essentially the progression of a DVT or the complication of, they can happen, they can um, form in the lungs or they can travel, which is the most common. Risk factors, again, being your Verkau's triad, pregnancy is a big one. Sudden onset, pleuritic chest pain. So they take a breath and it's very sore. Shortness of breath as well, because they're not getting as much um, oxygen to their blood. Um, DBT symptoms. And there are some other rare things like hemoptysis. You're going to do your Wells score, which I've got in brackets here. It's a little bit hard to read, but just keeping in mind a few of those things. ECG will show right-sided changes if it's late. And then there's this rare sort of change, which I've put in the comment section. Um, but I think just remembering that it's right-sided changes. So right axis deviation, right bundle branch block, doing your coags if you can find any obvious cause. Um, and a CTPA or a VQ scan will give you a diagnosis um, rather than a, say your D-dimer, which will give you an indication. Other things to do would be looking into any endogenous or inherited causes of thicker blood. Management, essentially if they're unstable, you're going to mention doctors A, B, C, D, and then thrombolize them. If they're stable, it's similar to a DVT, give them heparin and then long-term anticoagulation. This absolutely will come up on your exams. It gets a big star, look how big that is. Verkau's triad we've been through um, and comes up in PATH as well. So stasis, endothelial injury, and hypercoagulability. Pretty easy to ask about a few of these. So surgeries, fractures, um, surgery comes up in endothelial injury as well because you're cutting things. Um, even like a peripheral, like a catheter that we would put in, a cannula, sorry, working in effect. Um, that can cause damage as well and be the source of it. Um, and then hypercoagulability is really important to ask about. And we'll go through hereditary because they're very hematological. Again, this will come up, but it's kind of easy to remember, I think. Um, hypercoagulability states are inherited conditions that cause your blood to be thicker um, and they can be acquired as well. So usually your hereditary ones are autosomal dominant. Ones to remember are these three here. Um, so factor V lie down is the most common and exponentially increased risk when you add it to the pill. So if someone just started the pill and then they got a clot, you'd be worried about factor V lie down. Protein C and protein S, if you just remember C is for clots and then there's an S on the end of clots, that's what happens. Um, and they work together in the coagulation pathway, just knowing that when they're low, you get lots more clotting and you can go back to that picture and see sort of how it works. Antithrombin 3 deficiency is another common one and you just treat it with anticoagulation. Acquired causes, essentially your Verkhaus triad that we went through. Lupid, uh, lupus antiphospholipid syndrome is an interesting one. The buzzwords for it are recurrent miscarriages and headaches um, and they need long-term anticoagulation and you just need to swap it to a pregnancy safe one if that happens. All right, moving on. We're making surprisingly good time. I'm so sorry if I'm going too fast. Um, but at least we can chat about a few things at the end. So a four-year-old boy is brought in by his mother because she's noticed that he has bruises on his arms and his torso. He's got growing pains at night that wake him up in a sweat and he's missing school because of tonsillitis. I actually wrote this question and I'm very proud of it. Good. 
I clearly haven't buggered it up. Excellent. Good, not a question mark in sight. So this one is trying to trick you a little bit. We've got the bruising, and then we're going to think about the other two factors, or the other two main blood components. Um, it doesn't really tell us much about anemia, but we know recurrent tonsillitis, so it's got lots of infections. Four-year-olds can have a little bit of growing pains, but it's usually when you're going through your growth spurt, which is a little bit later around puberty. And waking you up in sweats from growing pains doesn't sound right. So this is an ALL being the most common cause of uh, leukemia in children and the most common cancer. The other ones um, you would expect, you wouldn't expect the white cell changes in I and F and just knowing that ALL is the most common in kids. So going through leukemia, this is when you get, um, why not AML? AML is more of an adult condition for a leukemia, but we'll go through that. So leukemia is when you have an extra proliferation of blood cells. You can have a myeloid voice lymphoid, which is essentially you need to do like immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry to tell the difference, except based on, I suppose, in that question, um, buzzwords and demographics. Acute versus chronic is something else to consider. So acute is when it's earlier in the cell's development, and that's when they're blasts. This happens really rapidly and it's usually aggressive, which means that it responds better to our treatment. Chronic is more of those later differentiated cells um, and is more mature in the cell type. Um, and you usually find this incidentally. There are a few risk factors. None of them are super specific, knowing that young people usually get the ALL. Um, trisomy 21 is closely associated with developing acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, and there are certain viruses associated with different leukemias and lymphomas. Again, we're going to see some pancytopenic changes. So our bone marrow is putting all of its energy into making either our blasts or making um, whatever other cells that we have low red blood cells, platelets and white cells, which are the same symptoms we talked about before. Because your blood is so full of blasts, you can have lots of clots because it's thicker. Um, you can get... Um, the cells move into your tissue. So gum hypertrophy, splenomegaly comes up a bit and non-specific changes. So your constitutional symptoms, fever, bone pain, lymphadenopathy. Investigations, we're finding a pancytopenia, but your white cell count can look high. So it can be up at 40 when the upper limit is 12 or whatever it is, because the machine has counted blasts, but functionally you have low normal white cells. On our blood film, you need to have more than 20% blasts in the periphery to consider it a leukemia. And because we had a pancytopenia, we're going to take a bone marrow biopsy. And that's where we'll see lots of blasts in there, um, more than 20% again, and we can do our lots of fun tests. This is our worrying cause of pancytopenia versus our less worrying acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, not that, aplastic anemia, sorry. So I've got the buzzwords at the top for both of these. Your AML is usually older people. And the main thing that you'll see on histology is your aura rods. Again, 20% blasts. You'll get the pancytopenia. There's not really much else that's new here. Some skin changes. So you get infiltration of the skin and that can be painful papules. Again, aura rods and then staging things for all cancers. We can treat the symptoms, so the red blood cells, the low white cells, and the platelets, um, and all febrile neutropenias will get a tazacin, um, which is just a broad spectrum antibiotic to get whatever you can. Hydration, antiemetics, chemotherapy things. Um, chemotherapy and bone marrow is how you can treat it. It depends on whether they're um, eligible for the bone marrow transplant. There is one type of AML that's quite interesting to know, which is acute promyelocytic leukemia, which you can treat with retinoic acid, vitamin A. There isn't much happening in that, to be honest. ALL is a little bit interesting. So one thing to remember is that B cell leukemia and lymphoma is bad, but T is terrible. So B is more common as well, which is good. Um, and it's a little bit easier to treat. Mainly B, B ALL um, comes up in in children, whereas TALL is a thymic mass in teenagers, so all of those T's together, and the kids play with balls, so that's fun. So mainly in 
uh, children, you'll have pancytopenia and pretty much rapid onset, other classic things, lymphadenopathy. And you'll get this classic um, findings of bone pain, brain changes, so meningitis, headache. So they might have neck stiffness and testicular swelling. And there might be a past history or um, a medical history of Down syndrome. Investigations, again, nothing exciting there. Management is the same with our symptomatic treatments, so red blood cell transfusions if they need that, chemotherapy. And because both of these respond really well to chemotherapy, we can kill the cells too quickly. And you get something called tumor lysis syndrome, which is essentially the kidneys get full of um, all of the cellular debris. So you wanna fill them up with fluids and flush their kidneys out. Um, and also allopurinol can help with that like DNA turnover. That is your aura rod or however you say it, aura rod. And these are just classic um, lymph cells, a blast. Um, and so you can tell that they've got big nucleus because they're working on their DNA and they don't need their cytoplasm to produce proteins and things. Pancytopenia in adult, most likely pediatric cancer. Chronic leukemia is when we're going to have some of those older cells. So CML, you've got the classic Philadelphia chromosome. So a translocation between chromosome 9 and 22, and that makes this um, BCR able protein, which just makes the cells turn over like crazy. Usually has a slow progression. And what happens with both of these conditions is that slowly they'll, they'll turn over and you get more and more blasts. And then when you hit that critical limit of more than 20% blasts, it's technically an acute um, condition. And given it's myeloid, it's going to become an acute myeloid leukemia. Not much new on here. They find it on a routine FBA where all of your white cell types are really high and you can get an itch because same with um, hay fever, when you've got your granulocytes um, degranulating and it gives you like itchy skin, that can happen in this because you've got way too many granulocytes. Um, and they'll get a splenomegaly as well. So CML is one of your causes of massive splenomegaly. Um, and you can find a bunch of them in the uh, five key points as well. Investigations, you'll have more mature cells. So Alex went through this in his vest buds, but it's essentially called a left shift. Um, and then classically on your fluorescent in situ hybridization, you'll find that Philadelphia chromosome and it's treated with a matinib. So I probably would remember that for CML. Um, having said this for all of this, I think for Haim, you just need to recognize these things, but not necessarily recall them, if that makes sense. Your CLL, um, slow proliferation, it's really old people, so 70, again, incidental, nothing fun on features. They do have these smudge cells, which are broken B cells, um, and otherwise you just watch and wait. And if it becomes aggressive, so it can turn into a lymphoma, then that's when you start to treat it. This is what it looks like where you've got just way too many of your um, myeloid cells. So you shouldn't see this much here and you can almost see no red blood cells at all. And these are your smudge cells. So they're completely broken open. CML is that translocated chromosome. So remembering that and CLL, probably not an issue. All right, what do you guys think for this question? Make sure I've got some time left, I do. So we've got a 42 year old man. He's got night sweats. He has left auxiliary lymphadenopathy and facial flushing. When he puts his arms up at our head, he's got facial flushing. So what are we going to do? If you guys came to Vespards, I'm pretty sure I've done this question before. Yeah, good. So this one you'd want to do a lymph node biopsy. Um, because they're there. And that's going to be pretty easy to access as well. There are some lymph node groups that aren't going to be. We can see they've got some nasty systemic signs. So night sweats, fever, weight loss, we're worried. Um, and lymphadenopathy is just easy to sample. Even if it's a solid tumour and you sample the lymph node, you might still get an answer there. All right, so lymphoma is a solid, solid hematological condition and it arises in lymphoid tissue. So this might be in your lymph nodes, in your payers patches, in your spleen. Generally, they'll have those rubbery lymph nodes that we were talking about. And the number of them, the size and the location is what contributes to your lymphoma staging. And that's also where that term B symptoms comes up. Um, usually in your peripheral lymph nodes and your Waldeyer's ring is the ring of lymph nodes that connect to the back of your throat. Extra nodal sites, 
in your stomach, testicles, brain, and they all have symptoms associated. Those B symptoms we were talking about is weight loss more than 10% of their body weight. Pardon me, fever and night sweats. Um, and they're actually uncommon, but good to know. And they just tell you that there's something highly proliferative and energy consuming happening. Later on, they can get um, bone marrow infiltration and those panpsychopenic symptoms. Hodgkin's lymphoma, so there's two umbrellas. Whoops, we'll go through them now. So Hodgkin's lymphoma is the minority and only covers five types of lymphoma versus non-Hodgkin is everything else. And there's many, 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 and you don't need to know them. I probably wouldn't even know that much about the Hodgkin's lymphoma, except maybe for the buzzword about um, Reed Sternberg cells. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma um, can be grouped into the aggressiveness of the different tumors. So indolent, aggressive, or highly aggressive. And again, there are some different translocations associated with these, but I wouldn't get too bogged down, um, but maybe just being able to recognize and identify rather than recall. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, as we said, the majority, and most of these are going to be B cells. So B cell is your most common, and it's also not as bad as your T cell or NK cells. In like a moderately old person as well, so 20 to 40, um, and nothing amazing on our features that's going to tell us it's a non-Hodgkin's or a Hodgkin's. Um, you can get an idea of how fast it's growing. So your low grade includes your malt lymphoma. So anything that causes inflammation can cause a malt lymphoma, classically H. pylori. Um, and another one for your massive splenomegaly, your hairy cell lymphoma. Your high grade or aggressive ones are Burkitt's lymphoma, which causes a starry pattern on histology. Um, and that's on histology rather than your starry sky on your renal biopsy for whatever that cause is. Um, even though it's the same buzzword. And this one is more likely in children, um, whereas your diffuse large B cell lymphoma is in adults. Investigations, we're going to take that, that uh, lymph node out and that's going to give us a lot of information. Um, and then staging again, which you can apply to every cancer. Chemotherapy is ABVD, which I don't think that you really need to remember, but it's down in the lecture notes if you want them. It's adriamycin, bleomycin, vincristine, and decarbazine, which is pretty boring to remember. Hodgkin's lymphoma is the minority of lymphomas. Um, there are a few other kind of interesting things happening here. Something called a pearl Epstein fever, which is when they get a really high fever for two weeks and then it goes away for another two weeks. Um, I've never actually seen it come up, but it's something associated with this. And the lymphadenopathy gets painful when they drink alcohol, which is a bit weird. There are different locations that all of the different Hodgkins can occur. Noting that uh, shortness of breath can actually cause a lymphoma, which is relatively common. Again, with the T-ALL, when they get a mediastinal thymoma sort of thing. Um, again, I think it would be really hard to remember these, but at least being able to recognize the different names. Um, auxiliary lymph nodes, whatever. It's all a bit hard to remember, I think. And I don't think you really need to. Excisional biopsy and then staging. And you manage this with RCHOP. One medication that is quite interesting in RCHOP is rituximab. And this targets CD20, which is one of your surface markers for B cells. And we know, whoops, we know that this is a B cell lymphoma. Um, so I think that's quite a good drug to remember. In terms of our Reed Sternberg cells, they're trying to move away from buzzwords. And so I would remember about the binucleated atypical cells on an inflammatory background. And that's sort of your official name for your Reed Sternberg cells, which I think is um, good to remember. And that's what that looks like. So inflammatory background with lymphocytes or whatever and binucleated. This one is a B cell lymphoma mainly with a massive splenomegaly. This one causes pain with alcohol and looks like an owl. Owl eyes. All right, we're not doing too badly. I actually think we might be doing badly, but anyway. 60 year old male, sudden back pain. He has a lumbar vertebrae crush fracture. His blood tests have anemia, high ESR, and a monoclonal paraproteinemia. What is the biggest risk factor for the fracture? And don't overthink it. Yeah, excellent. Cool. 
squid, perfect. So this one is multiple myeloma. So before you get to those blood tests, it could be a metastatic prostate cancer, but once you add in those typical features, which we'll go through, um, it's looking more and more like a multiple myeloma. So if we rem remember back to that flow diagram, if this is when you're getting to the end and you've got your plasma B cells that have dedicated their life, their memory life, um, to producing one type of immunoglobulin. And so now when we have a cancer of that, it's producing too much of that one immunoglobulin. There are different types depending on the isotype that it's switched to, um, but IgG is the most common. And it generally has poor prognosis, but it does happen in older people in the first place. Um, so it's sort of hard to separate the two. It can be asymptomatic, which is when you get these terms of MGUS and asymptomatic myeloma, but I don't think they would test it in that way. And then your classic symptoms being your CRAB, so um, hypercalcemia, renal failure, anemia, and bone pain, and all of the symptoms that then associate with that. Um, so your moans, groans, stones, whatever they are. Um, and then bone pain is classically how they present with a spontaneous fracture. In terms of your investigations, we're looking in all sorts of bodily fluids for those high proteins. So in their urine, it's called bent stone, and in their blood, it's called the paraprotein bands or an M spike. Um, we're looking for their anemia, so low hemoglobin. And also when we look on the film, they get this rouleau stack, stack formation. And that's just because there's inflammation and their red blood cells are getting a bit sticky. So that's also related to your ESR and how that works. We've got um, renal failure. So we're going to reflect that in our uh, electrolytes um, and our renal function, as well as a high calcium on our CMP. They do get lytic lesions in their bone pain, and that's something important to know for pathology about what causes a lytic lesion and what causes a blastic lesion, um, and lytic just being thinner areas. So you can see this pepper pot or raindrop skull. The way we manage it, if it's asymptomatic, we just watch it and we can uh, monitor their urine and their blood for how much protein is happening. Symptomatically, we're going to address most of the aspects of our crab symptoms. So for the bones, it's our classic osteoporosis management, which you guys will go through in endo. Kidneys, um, rehydration, plus or minus dialysis if it's getting that bad. And anemia, we can transfuse them and give them EPO um, to try and help things. Um, given this isn't related to their diet, it's not related to absorption, any sort of supplements won't really work. We can give them chemotherapy, which again is vincristine, which has actually come up in a lot of chemotherapy for these. So that would be a nice one to remember as well. And you can give them a stem cell transplant, but because it happens in a larger age group or an older age group, um, it's generally not going to work as well. So this one has a single immunoglobulin. All right, I think this is our last question. A six-year-old male has headaches, blurred vision, itching all over his body after a hot bath. He is found to have a plethoric face and moderate splenomegaly with a hematocrit of 65%. Excellent. Hematocrit is quite a fun little reading. And it's essentially you spin, spin the blood down and you look at how much of the blood is full of something. But you guys have got it. Yes, polycythemia rubra vera. So your hematocrit is telling you that 65% of the blood is red blood cells, which should usually be down at about 35 to 45. And these, the rest of these are quite classic as well. So this brings us to chronic myeloid disorders which includes your myeloproliferative disorders, which are these ones here, plus CML, which we've already been through, and myelodysplasia, which is when you have an underproduction instead of the overproduction. And this is pre-leukemia, so you get blasts, and that's pretty much all I would remember about that. CML we've been through, so you've just got excess of all of your lineages of the myeloid lineage. Um, polycythemia rubra vera being more red blood cells, um, and again, due to Jack 2, you get the itching after a hot shower, who knows why, facial plethora, and you can get um, clots as well because you've just got really thick blood. Um, the way to treat this is to just give blood regularly. So that can either be um, blood that no one gets or you can actually donate it. Primary myelofibrosis, which we were talking about before, is when instead of replacing, instead of getting lots of myeloid lineage, you replace your bone marrow with scar tissue. Um, and so you'll get 
a tear, teardrop cells and a little bit of an anemia and a dry tap as well, because when you're trying to get tissues out or cells out, there isn't as much there. Um, stem cell transplants, you're just trying to like clear it out and replace it. Essential thrombocythemia, which is hard to say, is high platelets. Um, and again, if you've got something that usually makes blood clots, then you can get arterial and venous clots because of that. Um, headaches can be nonspecific. Low-dose aspirin, which we know targets um, platelets, so it's an antiplatelet medication, so we can give that. And in both instances, you can give this drug called hydroxyluria, which I know very, very nothing about. So this one, you'll have an isolated elevation or drop in your hemoglobin platelets, um, and usually in an older patient as well. So that is it, which is five minutes to spare, which is more than when I practiced it by myself, which is nice. Um, I'll show you guys a bit of what I used. So Amboss has some really good summaries as well as the BMJ. Um, practice questions will be really good at this point. And I've got some buzzwords as well. But if you guys have any questions, you guys can read this and send me some questions if you have them. So I thought RCHOP was used for non-Hodgkin's diffuse large B cell. I, as I understand it, it's for Hodgkin's. Um, but I suppose in a lot of instances, if you have a B cell lymphoma or B cell issue, then you would give rituximab. Um, I hope that answers that. I can have a better look. Um, Desmopressin was for um, von Willebrand's disease. So only when you have type one or less severe conditions where they're not having spontaneous bleedings, will your desmopressin work to increase von Willebrand's production from your endothelial cells, which is a little bit interesting. I don't know how it works exactly. Um, if, if anyone sent me a message that I didn't see during the lecture, just send it again. Because there's lots of DBAFG answers that I can see. Otherwise, so there's some of the extra um, buzzwords that were in like a big buzzword document that I'm sure you guys have access to, plus the purple ones all the way through. I do have some extra questions actually, let's do that. These are some questions that have been marked as heme, but I don't personally think are hematological in the slightest. Um, a 45 year old woman has acute shortness of breath and stridor four hours after a total thyroidectomy. Her pulse shows uh, oxygen saturation of 90% on room air. You take off the dressing and it's swollen. What is going on? That's good, a couple of answers coming through. So does this one tell you? Yeah, so it tells you it's a thyroidectomy. So something that you guys wouldn't have seen in um, hospitals is that every patient that has had a thyroidectomy travels around with like this little box and it's a box of essentially like suture cutters because your thyroid has three arterial supply and can bleed really easily. So the answer here is a post-operative hemorrhage. So it's applying so much pressure that you're essentially getting um, compression of her airways and it will affect everything in there as well. An abscess wouldn't happen as quickly. Surgical emphysema would be very bad, but it would have like subcut emphysema. Laryngeal edema being fluid would take a little while. So the most likely cause in an immediate post-operative would be a hemorrhage. And that's a bit of like po um, perioperative care. Actually, we're going to skip that because that's a boring question. 23 year old man has recurrent nosebleeds and I did this question. <laughs> a 24 year old Cypriot man is presenting with worsening anemia and jaundice. He had a film taken several weeks after and he showed Heinz bodies. I sort of skipped through this. So this will test, um, not if I taught you well, but if you know things, I guess. Yeah, perfect. So your Heinz bodies are classically associated with your G6PD deficiency. Um, and that is a cause of an oxidative um, hemolysis. So you have a trigger and then you can't metabolize it very well. And then your cells just go, can't do it. And then they burst. Well, this one's quite interesting. 24 year old woman with SLE has an acute anemia. 
She was treated with steroids. Her direct Coombs test was positive strongly and direct antiglobulin testing was positive with IgG alone. I could not tell you what that last part of that means, but I think there's enough there. Good, yeah. So the main thing that we're going to use our direct Coombs test for is on this list, which a lot of you have gotten, is our autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Also in the setting of a lupus, it's not unlikely that they've made some antibodies against lots of things. Oh, a little drug question for you, and that'll be my last one, because you guys get a break. Michael is 45 years old. He has severe eczema. He takes medication for this problem and it inhibits the number of circulating lymphocytes, regulating his Th1, Th2 response. What drug is it? Good. Initially a very scary question. I am no pharmacologist and I don't enjoy these things, but good. So your Aspirin has different effects at different levels. So low dose, medium dose, high dose. High dose is really good for migraines, low dose for your antiplatelet effect. Celecoxib, a pain relief that is um, COX specific. Ibuprofen, another analgesia working on that COX pathway. Lipooxygenase is that thing that you get taught in the year A that you don't remember very well. Paracetamol, central working. Your hydrocortisone is going to be anti-inflammatory. So that's the only one that's really working on your TH1, TH2. Perfect. I will leave it there. There are some more questions in there for you guys, as well as all of these five key points as well. That's okay. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, good luck for your OSCEs as well. Oh, the last question was um, hydrocortisone. So like a steroid. Sorry, I did go through all of them. All right. If anyone has any questions, send them through and I can answer them as well. Otherwise, have a good break. Perfect. Thank you so much, Maddie. Um, I'm sure I speak on everyone's behalf for Nessica that you and Vazbuts have been an absolute savior this year. Would not know what to do without y'all. Um, so you, you guys will be great. Group. Um, for everyone else, we might head off for a bit of a lunch break and come back at 2.30 for some ID, derm, some breast, as well as some pathology. Um, feel free to leave this meeting. Um, I'll still keep the meeting going, but then you can join back with the same link.